I would like to welcome our wonderful guest today, the incandescent Meg Bussert. Welcome, Meg. Hello, Alan. How are you? <laughs> I am doing very well. I'm so happy that you were able to join us and we can chat a little bit about Brigadoon and yourself and all of those wonderful things. So let's just jump right in. Speaking of Brigadoon, um, you actually starred in the 1980 revival of Brigadoon on Broadway as Fiona. I did. That's true. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because um, I do believe, you know, Alan J. Lerner was around at that point, wasn't he? He really was, yes. Yes, and I had uh, previous experience working with him. So it was uh, grand to be uh, working again with him, this time as a leading lady, where before I wasn't, you know. So this was one of, um, Brigadoon was, I, I had a show, which we'll talk about later, so that, that I had been, I started in the chorus. I was a good little singer, and I became because I talk good, I guess, I started understudying and then I studied all that kind of stuff. So there was a, a, a role before uh, Fiona that kind of got my attention uh, from the casting people and, and the critics, whatever. So Brigadoon was delightful that it came to my life. And um, it was the, the casting was all non-stars. So uh, it was uh, a ensemble of principals and chorus people who were just regular what we would call working actors you know and uh that was um that was very special because uh we were all working from our hearts and working from creating this world as you know brigadoon very well that show cannot be done without the the brigadoon ensemble uh creating an amazing uh, other world absolutely they have to they they all have names they all have to be somebody it's not just generic town to the left um, which is wonderful. So, and you also worked with the wonderful Marty Vidnovic uh, playing opposite you. And yeah. he, went on, he went on to play Judd in the big revival of Oklahoma. But like you said, these uh, wonderful working actors in New York, um, Robert and I call them New York names. Everybody in New York knows who they are, but John Q. Public may not, but all terrific, wonderful people. Now, uh, the audition process, I know you and I had chatted prior about some things. Now, was this one of those, um, or was that the next show that we're going to talk about where it was all the leading ladies in town? Oh, this, this was this one. Uh, it was, um, I was getting a name of, gee, if you want to do an old show, you know, with a, a soprano-y kind of person who might be a little um, uh, energetic, <laughs> I was in that little group. And there were about four or five of us uh, in that little group that, uh, the, you know, the same names came up when they started casting. And so you would go through the preliminary audition, then you get to the callbacks. And for some reason, uh, the casting people, we would do the callbacks out of theater, but they would call us all at the same time. So we said, uh, it was Maureen Brennan and Chris Ebersole and Christine Andreas, and those are the names that come to mind immediately. You know, we would walk in and there we all were, <laughs> within 15 minutes of each other and hi, how are you? So we had uh, several other auditions, not for such big things as this, this Broadway gig. We decided that, you know, we're gonna continue running into each other auditions because this is how they they run them they have all the leading ladies come at the same room and then they see them and we're all different naturally and so they say well which works with who and oh, it was horrible <laughs> so we decided that we were going to be best of friends as opposed to uh, mortal enemies and we uh it was a bit of a joke but it was so much fun because we would walk in the casting people would surreptitiously, surreptitiously look how are the ladies going to get along and <laughs> We're not named names because we were the working actors and we all knew each other in our families and hot, you know, so it became that moment of greeting everybody and then going off to the corner to prepare your audition, which you always have. I bet it confused the heck out of the casting people. They were expecting cat fights and fun and all I got was some lovely, wonderful, charming ladies. Yes, and it was, it was fun because we, we performed <laughs> that for them, I think, and we knew exactly what we were doing. So. Now going back to Brigadoon, um, it was the first major revival in quite a few years. I mean, I think you had mentioned and I had mentioned prior when we were chatting that there was a city center revival or some such, but this was on Broadway and they hired an English director, which I, it's an interesting choice. Yes, uh, Vivian Mathlon, it was, uh, but maybe 
not so far away because um, uh, Alan J. Lerner himself was what they called an Anglophile. He was sort of fascinated by uh, um, English history. And if you look at his body of work, you can see it in Camelot and My Fair Lady and Brigadoon. And uh, so, uh, yeah. So hiring a British uh, director was not so odd. He did, however, maintain, he kept uh, Agnes DeMille and uh, the, the original choreographer uh, woman, God bless her soul. And we used to call her Aunt Aggie. So Aunt oh. Aggie. <laughs> now, um, did he make any, um, did he have a different vision than maybe the original production or? Um, yes. Tell us. That, yes, he did. And he got permission from Alan to, to make some adjustments in, in the script and uh, kind of reorganizing where the back break would be, that kind of thing. Um, so one of the things I think we had mentioned at another point, uh, he changed the act break, which, you know, uh, just changed the energy, which was, was kind of interesting, which we'll talk about later. But he, uh, I'll go home with Bonnie Jean, which was the big male, well, it was the big, uh, I'm going to marry this girl. I'm coming back and this is the girl I'm going to marry and I'll tell you why. And a great, great song. It goes back to the, you know, operetta style things. But originally it was written where the men and the women were together on stage with Harry uh, singing about um, Bonnie Jean. And uh, Vivian Madelon decided, yeah, you know, this should just be the men. Uh, it's, it's the, uh, you know, it's the, what is it, the bachelor party, you know. Right. So that, that, which made perfect sense because the men could get a little more earthy with some of their illusions and some of their, you know, um, uh, discussions of other women within the, you know, it, it just, it made way more sense. And it was a lot how of- did, How did Aunt Aggie take to that? Well, she was fine with it until when the vocal ended and then the dance was supposed to start. And uh, the director, once it was all done and set and shown to Madam, uh, she, Aunt Aggie said, um, uh, uh, Vivian said, you know, okay, so so now we, we start the dance. How do how do we start the dance? And she went over to the score and kind of pointed at the, you know, eight measures away from where the vocal ended. Maggie starts dancing here. She always had this kind of affected speech. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know, Catherine Hepburn did. They all sound English, but they weren't. Maggie starts dancing here. And um, Vivian said, well, the women aren't on stage yet. She said, I know, but she starts dancing here. So get them on stage. <laughs> Because when you're Agnes DeMille, you can say that. And we all went, oh, okay. So it was, it's kind of, it was kind of an awkward segue, uh, but the women kind of came in at the end, the tail end, of the, you know, and then all of a sudden the dance was as the dance was. And uh, it was brilliant narrative dancing as uh, Agnes almost, you know, she and Jerome Robbins probably invented. Um, and I never understood uh, how, how a dance could tell a story until I worked with her on that show. It, it was just brilliant to see... Uh, them stage and I was a singer actor so I was allowed to move in those days um, yes. you know but that's so interesting that you mentioned that because, well, let's face it, um, for those of you who don't know, who are watching and listening, Agnes DeMille was the original choreographer with Rodgers and Hammerstein for Oklahoma, narrative dancing, carousel, narrative dancing. She directed and choreographed Allegro, which was the first concept musical. Then she had Bloomer Girl. Then she had Brigadoon. I mean, she was the go-to choreographer. Once things changed, then it was just more than hoofing, that there were stories. And that's one one of the wonderful things about Brigadoon, in my opinion, because you know, obviously, Meg, how I feel about Brigadoon, um, that uh, Robert LaFosse, who is, was, is coming to choreograph, did um, a mini revival in 97 with um, Agnes DeMille and Jim Z. DeLapp, her wonderful assistant as well. And so that's really important to us, that those narrative dances and stories are told. And another plus on her side is that she was a feminist. Um, most of the other huge choreographers at the time were men and were naturally telling whatever story they were telling, but uh, all, a thread that is so strong through all of Agnes's work is the female story. Absolutely. That's one of the biggest examples would be Oklahoma, where uh, Lori goes into a dream and she, she has the dream ballet, and it's the story of Lori getting married, of a young woman uh, kind of confused and, mm. and uh, marvelous, marvelous storytelling. In fact, that story back then, um, Hammerstein did not understand what Agnes was telling in that narrative and wanted to cut it. And they, the first or second time they actually performed it in front of an audience, the audience went crazy. So he said, well, I guess we don't cut it. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was so old school. I, I want to say that, uh, you know, Alan's head full of useless 
musical theater trivia. Um, just ask Robert or anybody who knows me. Um, I guess originally they were talking about what the big end of the act dance would be. And I guess, uh, I want to say it was Hammerstein who said, well, what about a circus ballet? Because, well, why not? Um, and he went, and she went, what? No, this girl is conflicted. We got to see what's going on in her head. And that's where that came from, which uh, nowadays we think, oh, old hat makes perfect sense but back then that was revolutionary right taking that uh, you think talking about brigadoon um you know all uh, the show certainly has been re-choreographed uh, in different iterations as it's gone along but all of all choreographers honor agnes they don't just do a dance they right. You tell a story, and most of the ones I've ever seen uh, understand that uh, this it's uh, when the Bonnie Jean, I'll go home with Bonnie Jean ballet, Jeannie dances her love and her mm -hmm. uh, um, commitment to uh, with all the women. It, it's right. just so beautiful, and uh, throughout the, the entire show, I've never seen a, a production with new choreography of Rigadon where they did not go from that narrative and go from that original story, create their own. So I won't tell you about the one I did when I was 25 then. Anyway, moving on, <laughs> moving on. Um, we're talking about Brigadoon with Meg Bussard um, because actually you were coming up here. You will be coming up here because we like to say at the Sharon Playhouse, nothing is canceled, things are just postponed. So uh, what we're doing is we'll do it next year. Great, is, if everybody's available, God willing, here we'll be. But the good thing is, is you were gonna come up and play with us and be in the show in a different role. You were um, going to be, well, in the script it says, Mr. Lundy. Um, I, I know that you have played it where it was just Lundy. I've seen it where it's been Mrs. Lundy. Um, basically, the, the, the wisdom of the town, the town elder. So, but you had done that prior um, when at uh, NYU a few years back. Yeah, that was uh, one of our, our um, uh, graduated uh, grad students who became an adjunct was then teaching, you know, was going to direct it. And she she uh, um, sat with me and I gave her, um, um, MK Lawson is her name, I gave her lots of inside information on the script. She went away the next, and came back the next day. She said, you know, I think, I think you need to be uh, Lundy, you know, I think. You know, and there had been a version that was written uh, that was going to be revived that never got done where there was a question as to, there was a lot of discussion, should Lundy actually be a man or could he be a woman? It, it, it never it materialized. So the idea was kind of out there. I think I know about that version. Was that the one that uh, Liza Lerner was putting together? And I want to say Rob Ashford was directing and choreographing that one. Yeah, that, was, that was the thing that I recall, right? They wanted to put it in, in 1970 or something. Yeah, and it was going to be very dancey. Very, everybody, like every, the Fiona was going to dance, the Tommy, everybody was going to dance. Yeah, so anyway, that didn't happen. Nope. But the idea of gender swap is, is a, a very interesting thing. I mean, those of us who grew up doing high school drama, you know, there's so many roles in uh, a high school casting where men, where the women take on the men's roles because there's always uh, 3,000 women to five men. Yep. Know? So frequently, Lundy had been played by a young woman. But in this case, um, it worked. Uh, I agree. Uh, we cleared it through equity. We cleared it through the, the towns, whoever was, everybody said, okay, fine. And it worked astonishingly well, and I can say that not just because I played it, because the language, uh, uh, he's an elder. He's kind of an eccentric elder, and he repeats himself all the time. And, he, and what he does in the play is he tells a story to Tommy, the story, the miracle of Brigadoon. And while he's doing that, he's telling it to the audience. The audience hasn't heard any of this before. And they go, whoa, you guys go to sleep, and you wake up 100 years later. Whoa, what's that like? So they're in their second day of the, of the miracle. And... Um, Moving it over to a female viewpoint kind of got in my head, you know, mashed up with the whole, um, uh, there was a time in England and in, in Scotland when, uh, many years ago, uh, where the Celtic and, uh, which was a bit pagan, Celtic and the, and the Christian religion mashed up. So there were a lot of stories that kind of went back and forth. So this information about the evil creatures that were running around the Brigadoon that had to be gotten rid of. Right was the minister who gave his life, you know, as, as a, a deal with the Lord that, that, they, that uh, the town would not be at the mercy of the evil creatures. So having a female, a wise woman, grandma wise woman kind of telling a story wasn't so far out of line. No, it actually, to me, and that's why I'm so glad we were, uh, are going to be doing it as well, is uh, in the script it does say witches. 
Um, and then of course, Lundy says, well, there are, are really no witches, but they're just bad people with bad ideas and I'm gonna protect the town. But it, that actually coming from a woman's point of view is very interesting to me. Yes, and it was, yeah. So I think uh, also it creates an interesting relationship between Fiona and uh, Fiona doesn't have a mother. Fiona has a father in the show. We never hear about her mother. So, I mean, in, in most communities, if you, it's the older women who take over those roles. If, if the mother isn't in place, you know, then the older woman would be a surrogate mother. And, um, and we actually see that with Fiona and her sister Jean, too. She is sort of motherly to Jean, and she, you know, she, Fiona's no nonsense, for those of you who know the show, um, you know, waiting for my dearie. She's in no hurry. If it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. She don't need a man, but then she meets Tommy. But she is, she's, you know, so it is another interesting layer that maybe Lundy is her, that surrogate mother, because you just, as you said, we don't know what happened to Fiona's mother. And having played both parts, I honestly believe that Fiona would have become the wise woman in her day. You know, Fiona is, she was ready to give up everything. That's okay. This is yeah. um, life. It's, it's the way it is, which probably, you know, Mrs. Lundy made, you know, a similar thing. So if you, if you get to be old, then you have, you know, uh, a responsibility or um, uh, a gift or something to give to the younger people. And it is always how to be a good mom. Right. Some it's uh, and what's wonderful what, what, how, when she talks to Tommy is she's kind of ferreting out him. Are, are you going to be, are you um, uh, philosophical enough? Are you ethical enough to be right. able to pick up your world and come and, and really participate in this one? Well, and she's sort of motherly to Tommy as well, even though she just met him. She's sort of pointy, but obviously, since the script is so wonderful, it's, it's amusing to the audience and it's amusing to Tommy at times. And I think it confuses him. He gets wide eyed that, wow. He knows modern women of 1947, but here's this woman ostensibly of 200 years prior who's more modern than anybody he's ever met. Right, and it, it makes a nice relationship, interesting relationship between Jeff, because uh, all of a sudden Jeff becomes a real jerk. Yeah, and so if people don't know, we're not going to say anymore because you just have to come see the show. And don't watch the movie because it's very different. Oh, yes. <laughs> I just had to throw that in. So um, we had mentioned, let's move on a little. We had mentioned that you had a history with Alan J. Lerner um, and that, but right after this production of um, Brigadoon on Broadway, you started another iconic show role that actually I'm sure a lot of the uh, viewers here have seen because it was filmed for HBO. It is shown all over the place. I still see it occasionally. It's on A&E or had been for a while. It's on YouTube. Um, and that is the wonderful revival of Camelot with Richard Harris. Where are the simple joys of maidenhood? Where are all those adoring, daring boys? Where's the knight pining so for me? He leaps to death in woe for me. Oh, where are a maiden simple joys? Shan yes, yes, that was really cool because it was now on uh, on film or. or small screen it's me and uh, what's her name Vanessa Redgrave you know so I <laughs> you're the two again <laughs> another movie don't watch the movie it's very different um and, and it's so wonderful but um so can you tell us a little about that and also I th thought I had read something that it actually didn't start with you it started with Christine Ebersol who we mentioned earlier but also with Richard Burton and then he left and then he uh, uh, Harris came in and then you came in then it went to Broadway very confusing it was, but part of the agreement of uh, having uh, Richard Harris come in and take over um, was the agreement that it would uh, revisit Broadway with him uh, because he was iconically known as the Arthur of the film. And so it made perfect sense for him to be cast in it. Um, he uh, hadn't been on stage for about 20 years. So he was a little nervous about coming back. You know, when you do something for film, I've done very little of it, but you finish the, the gig and you're done. You know, and then you go on to the next thing. You can shoot out of order and everything. But in a, in a play, in a musical, it's eight times a week. You start at the beginning and you work your way through. So if you had a really bad night the night before, you can't bring that into today's performance. You know, or if you're not talking to a particular actor from yesterday, you can't bring that into today's performance. So that was, a, a, a for me, that was a, a really interesting thing. And for him, it took him a while to relax into the role, I think. 
Isn't that interesting? Right, uh, just a little tiny little sidebar. Um, Robert and I worked on a national tour of Camelot as well with a celebrity. We did it with Michael York for six months. And just as you said, he hadn't been on stage for a long time. He was a little older than, you know, maybe the role should have been. Um, he, this day is a good day, tomorrow's a bad day. But it's really interesting to see these iconic stars suck it up and do it. And um, I know Michael did, and did Richard do the same thing? Yes, yes, he did. And sometimes he got annoyed with me because I might change something. You know, <gasps> I had been warned. I said, you know, they, they just said, just smile. <laughs> just smile and be nice. And then, you smile know, and, <laughs> and it, it did work out. And we had some, as difficult as he might be, part of him was just kind of dealing with why, why the Arthur in the film and the Arthur on stage were so different. It took him a while to figure that out. But we had some very humorous moments. We had some very oh, funny moments. Like? favorite we were on a we toured for about a year before we went into new york and we had two different sets because we played so many different theaters around the country and some theaters backstage were very big and some were smaller so we were up in the um uh seattle uh the fifth avenue um, mm -hmm. we played the fifth avenue too <laughs> there was something about the backstage they, there was one set piece that was three-dimensional that couldn't get in so they had another option which was a flat piece a flat to the um a theater a very you know fancy flat. <laughs> so it was the it painted and it was on uh the set was the set and i was on stage Pelinor was on stage richard was on stage so these three characters and um at one point and it was i think it was the scene where it was after she had met um uh lancelot and and they were trying to decide what to do with uh, the the um what arthur invented the the circle you know right the round table round table and everything so there was a discussion about that so in this discussion all of a sudden someone had bumped into the the flat in the backstage and the whole thing was just waffling and uh they of course we all saw it and so richard looked up the um uh, the gentleman playing Pelinor also looked up. The two of them looked at each other because they all had some English music hall about them. So the improv thing was in their soul. And they looked at each other and they screamed, earthquake. So the two <laughs> of them and grabbed the, the waffling flats and they kind of held them in place. In the meantime, um, uh, the audience is starting to titter and start to laugh. What and are then, you doing? Night and the two, well, the two of the, them started going back and forth and, and, and just going on and on about earthquakes. I didn't think be earthquake Camelots, you know, in California. They're just all everything. The audience was hilarious. I had the next line, the next real line. Perfect. So I, I kept trying to to break into the gentlemen who were improving, having a great time, and trying to calm me up. Didn't work. So every time I started to talk, they both would look at me like I was crazy, and then they would go on and chatter, and then I would try to talk again. Each time the audience is escalating all of their response. Finally, I just started to laugh and cry at the same time because it was so hysterical. I didn't know what to do. So I'm, my body is shaking. Richard came up and just kind of enveloped me and started, you know, doing this and said, the queen is indisposed, you know. And he's like, <laughs> some more. So it was live like, theater. You can't make this stuff up. Live theater. And that's what's yeah. so wonderful about live theater. Okay, I have one more thing about Camelot that I don't think you and I have ever talked about. Um, as I mentioned, Robert and I did um, a major revival tour of Camelot with Michael York. Uh, they, um, Michael Lerner, uh, Alan J. Lerner's son, and uh, rewrote the script. His uh, daughter, Liza Lerner, um, who I'm going to get to try and come up and see ours, by the way. Uh, um, she produced, and but they they really changed the script a lot. Um, so I I was going to ask you about that, but they cut my favorite part in the show. And since this video is out there with you on it, I did watch it recently, and you're a dream. It is the naked speech in Act Two when. Okay. Because Guinevere's, uh, for those of you who don't know the show terribly well, um, and you think of Julie Andrews and she's so prim and she's so proper and, and that's how she is. She's, she's Mary Poppins and she's that way through the entire show. But Ellen J. Lerner wrote a wonderful monologue for Guinevere in Act Two when they're trying, and it's right around the time of What Do the Simple Folk Do, which totally makes sense. Uh, she's just trying to say, I'm a real person and I'm in this big ass castle and I'm trying to have a good time. And she basically talks about running around the castle naked um which you would so not expect to be in Camelot I don't believe it was in the movie I, um and I don't believe it's been, but they cut it and I so missed it so I had to re-watch it with you and I will say Miss Bozart you tore it up thank you 
Well, there was a discussion about that. There actually was, even even while we were, you know, putting it together. And I think uh, what what we came up with, and I don't know whose idea it was, but it was it was she was talking to her husband. So even though uh, you know there was a confusion in her mind as this hunky young man has kind of walked into her life, there was a, a there was a strong strong bond between, which is why she was so conflicted. Um, between she and her, and her husband, so opening up like that with something that intimate is was perfectly fine. Yeah, and yeah. it's funny. And yeah. and let's face it, certain shows need a little funny now and again so they don't drag. I'm just I said it; it's out there. <laughs> well, I have to tell you that I I had a little reputation for taking these these roles and making them funny. I was I was a funny Fiona. I was a, a funny uh, Marion, and and I was a, an hysterical um, Laurie. Well, talking about um, Marion, because I was just going to go to that. So it seems like you had mentioned earlier in our little conversation that you were one of those go-to gals when they said, you know, nowadays, well, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, it was, they called Rebecca Luker or they got, you know, when, because there were only X amount of people uh, to do these classic roles. Let's face it, very few, especially uh, when you were around in the 80s or so, uh, could sing them. Um, no offense to those ladies out there, but, you know, a few of you could very well. Like you mentioned, Christine Andreas, Christine Eversole, yourself. Um, so you actually did a major revival um, of The Music Man, actually starring yourself and Dick Van Dyke. And that was one of the most fun experiences of my entire life. He taught me, and this is what I wanted to, to bring up, uh, he taught me how to be funny. He uh, actually worked with me. There was a couple of scenes between Harold and Marion where they, they chatter on it. I think it was like right after the Charlie Cowell scene uh, you know, where she kisses Charlie Cowell to, to make him late for the train and then Harold you know comes in and they have this wonderful discussion and she talks herself out of thinking that um, the, the music man is a bad guy because she's kind of falling but it's all the words are coming out of her mouth and what Dick Van Dyke did so well is he could he could listen as the character and get confused and he'd do all of these takes, very much like in, in the Dick Van Dyke show. So um, he came up to me when I was working on it. Uh, Michael Kidd was our director, and he was off working with the dancers on something. And I was like, oh. So Dick came over, and he sat next to me, and he said, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go out there, and you're going to do the whole scene all by yourself, to yourself, and you're going to convince yourself that there's nothing wrong with me. And I'm going to look at you so confused. And he said, you just don't worry about me. You go on. So, you, so he told me as actually to do it as a monologue and it works so brilliantly that's yeah. when you don't mind taking direction from another actor which uh for those of you who don't know is a big no-no in show business you're never uh, one actor is never supposed to give direction to another actor but when you have dick van dyke helping you be funny i think it's okay yes and the, and the director is off you know with the choreo you know with his other excellent thing in mind but yeah that kind of thing i also you know when i did um uh, South Pacific. I learned from Richard Kiley. I mean, I was going to bring that up next. I'm like 20 or some years older than me, so I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to not. In fact, I would go illicit. Uh, so, so what can I do? What do you think? Um, for those of you who don't know, or may do or not, uh, Richard Kiley was the original Don Quixote in Man of La Mancha. Brilliant. I'm sure he, he did a lot of TV and other things, but that was his most iconic role. And I was going to bring that up, uh, Meg. That. Let's face it, you played every leading lady role in major, major productions. Now, um, the South Pacific that Meg just mentioned was done in Los Angeles at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. Well, at least that's where I saw it, because as you, many of you people know, Robert and I are from Los Angeles, and I actually saw that production. And when I became friends with Meg, I said, well, you know, we met once a long time ago, um, and this was, for all those of you who want to know, this was before I met Robert, you all know that we've known each other for 25 years plus years. Uh, and I actually have a program, I think Robert's going to put it up right at this moment, of uh, the show with Richard Kiley's signature, Meg Bussard's signature, and Brent Barrett, who, um, another wonderful, wonderful performer. He was a phantom of the opera. He was um, just so great. And I've, you know, Robert and I know him very well too. It is just so funny how things change and people in your lives who you were supposed to know then and then now, you do. Yeah. So what was that like? Um, and what, that production never made it to New York. No, it was supposed to go out on a whole year's tour and then come back. We'd all had our apartments, you know, sublet. <laughs> and then it closed after, after um, the, the run at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. I'm not, I, they kind of ran out of money. They didn't, uh, whatever. But they were sold out in, in San Francisco. And we closed. We were really kind of pissed at the whole 
the whole situation. But uh, when I, I had a, at that time, a something called a famous letterbox that I would like to keep. I wasn't the first choice as uh, for Nelly. I was like the, the somebody else was cast. And, and you I, know what people, all of us, very few of us are ever the first choice, but hey, we get the jobs. <laughs> Uh, so that, that it was a, a really remarkable experience, and I totally loved it. But what was I saying? Oh, yeah, my famous letterbox. I'm old. Um, so I had when I would get uh, opening night uh, telegrams and things from famous people, I would just shove it in there. And the, you could be famous because I thought you were famous. You know, it didn't have to be, you know, whatever. So anyway, opening night in the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, we're getting all of the every equities. All these people are saying, "Oh, you know, have to you know break a leg and all that kind of stuff." Well, I got one like hand delivered to me in my um, uh, my dressing room, and I'm, I'm opening it up, and I'm going, ah! "It was from Mary Martin." And what she said, I memorized it first. Second, I wrote it. She said, "Always be stuck like a dope with a thing called hope, and you'll have joy the rest of your life." And that is a quote from Nellie's first song, "Cockeyed Optimist." And I just started to cry. <laughs> I ran to to now, had um, you had you ever met her? No, I had not. Uh, fortunately, I'd met um, the other ladies that I did roles, you know, um, Julie Andrews and a uh, great relationship with um, Barbara Cook. But anyway, I, I ran into um, uh, his dressing room, you know, and I popped it up and then he said, he put his arm around me and the two of us are going, oh, isn't that wonderful? And he said, I didn't get anything from Enzio Pizza, you know, so <laughs> who we was no longer around, I don't Well, know. yeah, considering he had died in the 60s, you know, I, I you know, I don't know. Um, that's so funny. Now, I, all of these wonderful, huge starring roles, starring Meg Bussard as this, that, that, which is wonderful. Um, but you know, Alan, he did a little research um, and that you have also done, you've had such a wide and varied career. Uh, I'm gonna mention one silly thing and then we'll get on to how you and I and Robert met and um, another iconic show. Um, and that, so the first one is a wonderful show from 1976 called Something's Afoot. And what it is, is um, for those of you who don't know, and it's hilarious, it is basically a takeoff of all of the Agatha Christie, uh, Miss Marple, and, and it's really sort of 10 little Indians, but um, everybody dies. <laughs> in a fun way. It's not like Les Mis where just everybody dies. It's everybody dies in a fun way. Um, and th the reason I bring that up is because I was looking through that cast list and you worked with so many wonderful people and so many wonderful, wonderful friends and people like Gary Beach and S. Mark Jordan and yourself and Neva Small and, um, I, oh, I'm, oh, and Sal Mistretta. Um, just so many wonderful people. But it, did, it wasn't a hit. How no. was your experience? Yeah, it was at the Lyceum Theater, and it it um, it kind of sold. It didn't do well uh, critically. I mean, it was beginning to to sell pretty well, but it was one of those. It was a parody, kind of of a parody. It was um, uh, you had to, if you understood the, the the source material, you had a blast. Right. If you understood what was being kind of um, made fun of all the way through. I was I under I was an understudy for two of the roles, two of the ingenue roles. Um, at that time, and uh, was directed by Tony Tanner, who another Brit with with marvelous music hall. Music hall and vaudeville are very similar, but there's a little difference. Oh. And um, uh, we were probably more, much more music hall than we were American vaudeville. We were, so maybe that was was part of it. But it was, uh, and this you keep talking about this, and I have to bring it up. There was a community. I don't. I'm sure it is happening now, but we had a very strong actor, director, stage management, producer community. And so as you did shows, you didn't always go into the next show right away, but you got to know people in various stages of their career and you kept re-meeting them at different times in their life and you never forgot those moments that we shared. So you become a family from a show, even if it runs for 10, you know, and then it, you all disperse and then one or two of you come back together in another, you know, and then you carry all of that history with you. And that was, was kind of wonderful. That is. Now, so how Robert and I met uh, Meg, everybody, and, uh, was in a production of, that I know she's done many of, of The Sound of Music. And uh, this particular one was up in Ogunquit, Maine. Um, but you played the? The Mother Abbas. <laughs> Another wise woman. This one has to sing a lot. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it uh, First time I did it was in the, Paper Mill Playhouse, and uh, Jimmy Brennan was the first director, and he and I go way back to uh, yeah. Equity Theater when we were, oh my God, $15 an, a week. Woo. Me and I worked. Um, anyway, it was, 
it suited me, you know, that I could sing it, number one, which was really important for that role, but the, Sadly, um, a lot of ladies can't. Yeah. You can. And seriously, they brought in some of the older ladies with great names who just actually couldn't and just said, yeah, can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> But the role is marvelous, and I didn't, I've done it five times. Algonquin was a great experience. And, um, but each time you do it, it's a little different because the Marias are all different. So they bring in, as a mother-daughter kind of uh, stereotypic archetypal relationship, which is very, they're very strong in that. Uh, Maria doesn't have a mother. She came as an a, a adolescent orphan to, to the convent. So mother kind of raised her. And what's wonderful about uh, Climb Every Mountain, when I first started to sing it, I go, oh my Lord, this is the, I can't, you know, this is the anthem. How do you, how do you sing that when everybody knows it? So I kind of worked with the Maria and it worked every single time after that. I said, well, I'm going to push you out the door because, you know, mothers aren't always the sweetest things to their daughters. Mothers and daughters can speak at a very high volume. <laughs> oh, yes. I have two sisters and a mother. I know. <laughs> So part of it was, you know, getting her to, to understand herself, but you know, you're old enough now, girl, get out and figure it out. Climb a mountain, walk down, you know, travel, you know, make a mistake. Just get the heck out of here. And, um, you know, they, RH gives you the same thing again to sing. So you're, you, now you've got to sing it again a half step higher. So now what do you do? So I just said, well, that's about me. So the first part of the song is about her getting her out. The second part was about Mother Abbess's. I've made you know, this was my choice and it was right for me. It's not right for you, but it's right for me. Something very smart, which helps us segue into what I wanted to talk about next, is that as a vocal coach, um, I know you do this because I know I do this and I think the, the better ones do. Songs often repeat, um, even like the same phrase three times. Alan J. Lerner in the musical Coco has a, there's a gorgeous song for the young man to sing about to the girl and it's called Let's Go Home and it, he does. He says, let's go home, let's go home, let's go home. Well, you can't just sing all three of those the same way. There has to be a point of view. And that's the thing that I was so excited to hear you just say. It's like, okay, I'm singing the exact same thing. What's, why is, why am I singing it different? Why is it up a half step? You know, and you as a smart actress and a smart person know that it has to, it can't just be, you're not just standing in a vocal booth, you know, singing a song. Um, and you were able to, I then assume, take that with you because you just retired from NYU as a professor. Right, yeah, so six months ago, seven months ago, yes, uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I retired because uh, I started getting, um, you know, uh, interest in doing some of these old lady roles and I wanted to free myself up a little bit from all my teaching and, and committee work. And then of course, now we're in this delightful time right now, but there's still things out there uh, that, that I find very interesting. And I think there was, especially since I'm, I would be a, I don't know, a specializing in the kind of older material, which is still getting done. You want to do it, you know, a lot. There was a, um, uh, understanding how those composers worked and how those lyricists work. Uh, it's a little different than doing Hamilton. It's a little different than doing um, uh, Evan Hansen. So, uh, all, and all those are brilliant musical theater pieces, absolutely brilliant. But when a, uh, a way that the composer gave you, they didn't intend for you to sing three verses of it the same way. They no, didn't. They didn't. And, and if you listen to some of those originals, um, like on old recordings, you hear the acting, you hear the smart people, the Mary Martins, those people, you hear what they're doing and, oh, now I get it. And also with the accompaniment, which, which underneath will change. The fact that it's a half step higher is a huge. I was just going to say that to you, that there are, you know, you listen to the modern orchestrations, things, uh, you know, like uh, people know that I have a very big history with Beauty and the Beast. And it is a gorgeous orchestration, but it is big and it is loud the entire show you and when i coach i i don't you tell me if you do the same thing meg is that um i'll have the person listen to the arrangement the orchestration the piano arrangement because if it's shifting a key there's a reason richard rogers shifted the key um to match the lyrics if there's if there, if it all of a sudden sorts starts to get quiet or goes minor 
there's a reason. What, and then I always ask the uh, singer, what's the reason? And because, you know, you want them to think. Right, right. No, that's, that's I think, very, very valid. And I do, do indeed do that. But I, I also want, I mean, the young people to recognize. If they're going to do uh, Evan Hansen and Brigadoon in the same season, and they're cast in both, there's going to be a shift, a slight kind of shift. Not a, um, doesn't mean you can't do both, because you can. But things sit in their world a little bit. You have to get them. Well, and that's, the th that's what's fun, I think, about summer stock. And, um, you know, I grew up doing summer stock in Sacramento, where you did eight shows in nine weeks. I mean, so you didn't have time to think. You just did what you were supposed to, learn all your stuff. But the feel of every show, every week was different. You were rehearsing one during the day and doing another one at night. Um, and that's what I like about, like, what our seasons are here in Sharon and other theaters, that um, they... You can do Brigadoon, and you, but then you can turn around and do something, dark, then a little light music, and then you can turn around and do something like Rent, um, and then you turn around and now it's uh, Thoroughly Modern Millie, and every one of them are completely different, but you're in all of them. How are you as an actor going to fit in each and, and fit well? And, and what you guys are doing, what you're doing as a producer is so cool because you're giving such a, a palette of variety for, which is subtly educational. So they're highly, highly entertaining, <laughs> all of them. But you're bringing young people, older people, middle-aged people, and they're all kind of, uh, you know, they're tasting different. Um, Absolutely. Different and not, not to say anything bad about schools because I want you to talk a little more about what you did at NYU, but I believe, uh, besides schooling, the best education is actually doing these things and watching people. And so that's why we're so happy to bring in, you know, stalwart equity folks such as yourself. Um, I remember the very first show when I got my equity card, it was a production of uh, The Music Man, and it was starring the wonderful John Davidson, who is was scheduled to come up here this season to do his one-man show, but now it's going to be next season. He's such a terrific guy. But learning so much just by watching him that when I played the role of Harold Hill, I actually said to John, I said, you know what, I just stole a lot from you because you, you were wonderful. Why wouldn't I? You know, homage and, you know, and that's what I think a lot of actors say to each other is like, oh yeah, I'll steal the best from anybody. You know, I'll get, I, some don't give credit. I totally will always give credit. If I steal something from somebody, I said, hey, Meg Busser did this in the show. It was freaking hilarious. I'm stealing it. Absolutely. I think we have that understanding as performers because you can't copyright that. Nope. So but you can give homage. So yeah. what did you actually teach? What did I teach? Um, right, at, at, at NYU I taught um, for a while musical theater history and then John Kendrick came on at musicals101.com and, and started doing that. And I taught um, acting, straight acting to the singers. Um, I was in a vocal performance program so my job was essentially to teach acting to singers. Sometimes I worked with the music but most of the time I didn't. And uh, I, I thought that initially but then I grew to love it because I understood how a singer thinks. I understood how a dancer thinks. And they don't, you cannot, as a singer-dancer, visceral instrument of storytelling, hold on to, uh, well, what's in my way? How do I get it? You know, what do I want? What's in my way? How do I get it? Those are wonderful things that you have to analyze. But when you're up there and you're taking the breath for the high C, that's not in your head. No. If you're doing 20 fuente turns, that's not in your head. You know, if the conductor is very slow tonight, that's not in your head. So there's so many variables that the, the musical actor has to be on top of. So teaching um, uh, a background and a, and a technique that can be adapted and modified slightly to the musical actor was kind of what I did, which I loved. That's so wonderful. And so I'm going to put her on the spot right now, everybody. So maybe we'll be able to get you to do a master class when you're up here next season. Maybe so. I have only 45 of them in my... In my <laughs> oh, no, I want a whole fresh one just for the Sharon Playhouse. No, I'm so kidding. Well, I have kept you long enough. I just want to ask one more question before I let you go, and thank you for that. Uh, I, we didn't mention Lolita, uh, which is fine, but it just put into my head, what is the strangest show that you've done, whether it succeeded or not, that um, you and or the rest of the cast went, well, here it is. I would say Lolita was really one of the, uh, that was my equity card. It was my first show, and it was, you know, people, uh, Alan J. Lerner and uh, John Barry wrote the music. Um, there, uh, Tito Capabianca, who was a big um, international uh, director, was directing it, and it was uh, musicalizing the story of a sick man who falls in love with 13 year old girls. Um, so that was strange. And, by Alan Taylor. Yeah, by, so 
there, there were the singing actors, uh, the actors and the dancing actors. And in those days, that was the end of where you couldn't do, you know, you, you belonged to one element and you stayed in that element the whole time. But I learned so much from watching um, those people um, operating. And I did get to, to know Alan. He was very, he's very friendly uh, and uh, so smart and just, it, he, you know, the, a scene would be horrible, a song would be horrible. They would work all night and they would come back and, and it would be markedly improved. Unfortunately, the entire premise was just un... Say, this still the topic and especially, I mean, it was, it was all right with James Mason in the movie, still uncomfortable, but then you put it on stage and it's, I'm sorry, it's icky. It's, it's just... A you make them sing, you know? Watching the story uh, coming out of the book is one thing, but then all of a sudden, lo, lo, la, lolita, where are you, my... Blah. Gross. But yet, I know you have sung this song, I have sung this song. Uh, there's a song called The Broken Promised Land of 15. It's a beautiful song. John Barry's terrific, as we all know. He wrote a lot of the um, uh, James Bond songs and such. Um, but, uh, and Alan J. Lerner's lyrics, I mean, come on. But yeah, you're having people singing about that kind of subject, maybe not so much. Um, what's interesting to me is, I mean, I've, we've seen some pictures of you um, throughout this interview. Um, you, you're still lovely, but let's face it, when you were a young lady, you were some hot stuff. How did you not become one of his nine wives? <laughs> I think because I, I knew not to be. <laughs> um, I came from the Midwest, so I was, you know, very open and, uh, but I don't know, even in the Midwest, we kind of know when to walk away. Um, Good call. Well, because there are the famous stories, not to denigrate anybody, but um, of like Richard Rogers, you know, you know, being very fond of blonde young ladies who audition for him and things like that. <laughs> well, I was out there. It was very strongly out there. But, uh, you know, ladies, you got to be smart. So uh, <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Meg Bussard, for uh, sitting here chatting way too long with me. But we had such a great time. We are so looking forward to seeing you up here in Sharon next year for Brigadoon. And again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Take care. Bye-bye, Ellen. Thank you. Thank you.